Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Simpkins Physics Corners. Mr. Simpkins with some gravitation examples today. Let's dive right in. A new planet is discovered that has twice the Earth's mass and twice the Earth's radius. On the surface of this new planet, a person who weighs 500 newtons on the Earth would experience a gravitational force of. So basically what we're doing here is we're using the universal law of gravitation, or Newton's law of gravitation here, and we're making a comparison. So let's consider the impact twice the mass and twice the radius would have on the size of the gravitational force. If I go like this and I say, all right, well, I'm going to double the mass of the planet. The object itself doesn't change because it says um, the person, right? So the person has the same mass either way. Your mass doesn't change when you move from one location to another. Your weight could, but not your mass. And the radius is twice the Earth's radius. And the G is a constant, so I should have put a 1 out there as well. Because what we're going to see here is the, the change or the factor of change here, you're going to have half the force of gravity acting on you on the other planet as you would on the Earth. So if you weigh 500 newtons on the Earth and you have half of that on the new planet, your new weight will be 250 newtons, or you would experience 250 newtons of gravitational force. So this is like that whole second page that we had, where what happens if you triple this or take a half of this, and one like that. I didn't mean, oh, let's go to our, our next one here, uh, new planet is discovered, and we skipped to the, ahead. I'm going to come back to that density one here if we have time, because it's pretty, it's a big newsy, all right? A planet of mass M orbits a star of mass big M, where M is much smaller than big M. The orbit is circular, so we have a little tiny planet coming around a big planet, and the radius is r, and the period is t. True statements about the planet's orbit include which of the following? The orbital speed is 2 pi r over t. All right, well, let's see. Well, that's always the case, isn't it? Isn't the tangential velocity always equal to 2 pi r over t? So that one's true. How about the gravitational force equals? <coughs> All right, so if we define it like this, g m times little m divided by r squared, yeah, sure. How about this one? If the orbital radius were greater, t would also be greater. So basically what this is saying is if you are orbiting further away, I'll make it zoom out a little bit, um, if you were orbiting further away, would the t also be greater? All right, so this could turn into a really long answer, but we'll try to keep it short. The orbital radius is going to have an impact on your tangential velocity. Now, just intuitively, if you're orbiting further away, doesn't it seem like it would take longer? Like Mercury is very close to the sun, it has a very short year because it goes around really quick. Earth has a longer year than Mercury because it takes it a longer time to go around. And then you keep going out further and further away, and the further away things are, the longer it's going to take for them to go around. That makes sense. They're making a bigger circle, right? Now, if you had to put math to this, we know that the force of gravity is the centripetal force. And now our full force of gravity equation here is going to look a little something like this. And the centripetal force is acting on the little mass, v squared over r. So if I go ahead and solve this here, I can come up with a relationship for what's happening here. I could say, um, let's see, what do I want to solve for? I just want to see what the relationship is between t. So I need to get t in here somewhere. Now you notice the m's cancel on both sides of the equation. So here we go, we got gm over r squared equals v squared over r. Looks like one of our r's will cancel on either side too. So now that leaves us with gm over r equals v squared. And But v squared, here's where I think it's interesting. v squared, as we know, is equal to 2 pi r over t, and that whole thing gets squared. So that's where things get a little funky, right? So then we have gm over r equals 4 pi squared r squared over t. And so we start to th see this here, and we start to realize that if, um, if I'm going to solve for some things here, I can it actually gets us to Kepler's third law. So check this out. If I do the solution here for Kepler's third law, and I take the velocity, and I plug it in for that v squared, okay, right there, then all this kind of crazy stuff happens, and we get to this idea that the period is proportional to the radius. Really, it's the period squared is proportional to the radius cubed, and you can see that if you rearrange some, oh, sorry, I forgot to square the t down here. You can see that if you rearrange the math, depending on how you want to arrange this, we can get to that similar expression, all right? You see how we're actually looking at the same thing? Here's our 4 pi squared over gm on one side, and here's our r to the third over t squared on the other side. Now, that gets really sloppy, but just think of it this way, all right? If this has to stay the same, because all of those are constants, then an increase in r would have to be 
rising an increase in t as well because you can't increase the numerator without increasing the denominator in order to keep the value the same all right so what that means is if r gets bigger t has to get bigger is that a long explanation yes but let's stick to the basics basics are what is the centripetal force and if the centripetal force is gravity we can derive some expressions for that let's go to another crazy one here Actually, this one's a lot more easy. You're going to like this one. Uh, a planet with half the Earth's mass and half the Earth's radius is discovered. What would an astronaut who weighs 800 newtons on Earth weigh on that planet? Okay, so here again, we have a comparison type problem. And so whenever we have a comparison type problem, we're going to just plug in ones for things that don't change, like the constant of gravitational acceleration does not, or, sorry, the constant of universal gravitation does not change. Uh, but it looks like it has half the Earth's mass. The mass of the person we're talking about doesn't change. And then it says um, half of the radius. Now, half of the radius, this is the only thing that's a little tricky about this one, is one half squared is one over four, and one half divided by one over four is the same as one half times four over one. That's a math rule about reciprocal, uh, multiplying by reciprocal. It's, it's the same as dividing by um, the reciprocal of that fraction. And this guy would get us two. And what's that mean? That means that if we were on a planet with half of the maths, mass and half of the radius of the Earth, we would weigh twice as much. So what's the final answer? 800 newtons times 2, or 1,600 newtons. Another comparison type problem. How about this one? A rocket lifts a payload upward from the surface of the Earth. The radius of the Earth is r. Oh, oops, sorry. The radius of the Earth is r, and the weight of the payload on the surface of the Earth is w. The force of the Earth's gravity on the payload is w over 2 when the rocket's distance from the center of the Earth is. All right, so let's take a look. What would it take to cut our weight in half? What would it take? What change in the radius would it take, I should say, to cut the weight in half? Well, the weight is determined by, big G, mm over r squared, right? So if I cut the weight in half on the right side, that means that has to give rise to a, a change in half on the, uh, sorry, on the left side, it has to rise to change in half on the right side. So this guy looks like this. And we're looking at, all right, how much does that thing have to change in order to make everything else a half? Why that thing? Because this is one, it doesn't change. The mass doesn't change. The mass of the, from the payload doesn't change. The only thing that changes is r squared. So the question is, how do we get one half equal to one over r squared? So we just solved for this. So if r squared is equal to two, doing a little cross multiplication, then we could say the radius is equal to square root of two. What does that mean? Now, a lot of people would think, well, if you want to cut the weight in half, you just double the radius because as you get further away, gravity gets weaker. Now, that's not how this works, see, because of that r squared in our force of gravity equation. So because of, if we actually did double our radius, that would be a, a cut of our weight by a factor of 4. 2 squared is 4. So that r, r on the bottom there, 2 squared, would be a factor of 4 of reduction in weight. But since we want a reduction weight by a factor of 1 half, the radius is going to be um, square root of 2 times the original radius. So what was that, like 1.41, the original r. Okay, so instead of out here at 2r, it would be more something like right in here. All right, so you can see how that would be like 1. Here's, here's 1 right here. Here's like the 0.41 for the square root of 2. So again, factor of change, setting it up with the force of gravity equation. Let's look at this one. <coughs> All right, uh, what is the radius of the satellite's orbit? So we don't get a whole lot of information here. But it does state it's in a circular orbit. So that means, what's that mean? It means the centripetal force is the force of gravity. Well, centripetal force is mv squared over r. Keep in mind, this is little m because that's the satellite that's actually doing the circle. Okay, but when we look at gravity, we have big M, m over r squared. Big M is the thing that's orbiting around. Little m is the thing that's doing the orbiting. So what's the radius of this uh, satellite's orbit? Well, actually, it doesn't matter what the mass of the thing, this satellite is. And big idea for the day, the mass of a satellite has no impact on its orbital motion. The mass of a satellite has no impact on its orbital motion. But if it does ask us for the radius, so let's solve for the radius. So we got v squared over r equals gm over r squared. I'm going to multiply r. <coughs> uh, actually, let, let's do this. Uh, let's cross multiply. Yeah, let's do that. So v squared r squared equals gmr. That cancels one of our r terms. So v squared r equals gm, or r is going to be equal to gm over v squared. So what's the radius of the satellite's orbit? Whatever shakes out between the mass of the planet, 6.667 times 10 to the negative 11, and divided by the velocity squared. Big idea again, the centripetal force is the force of gravity. You can derive equations thusly from that.
How about a spacecraft is in a circular orbit? And it says it orbits at a certain height above the planet's surface. Okay, what additional information is needed to calculate the speed of the spacecraft in orbit? Here's the big idea for today. If you are orbiting around a planet, that planet has a certain radius. I'll call it big R. But if you're out here in space orbiting, you are orbiting, I'll call this H, the height above the planet. And it does give us that, right, above the planet. The thing is, that's not how gravity works. Gravity doesn't act between the surface of the planet and the satellite. Gravity is a force, an attractive force, that acts between any two objects' centers of mass. All right? And what that means is if we're going to consider the r in the gravity equation, it's got to be this entire piece right here. So in addition to the height above the planet's surface, what we need is also the radius of the planet. Why? <clears throat> because when we go to plug in into fg equals big G m, m over r squared, that right there is actually going to be the result if you look at our diagram of the radius of the planet plus the height of orbit okay so keep this in mind if you're doing orbital problems it the the force of gravity acts between two objects centers of mass not between the surface and the object itself let's go to another one <clears throat> uh, we're given a speed and a height above the earth's surface the satellite experiences an acceleration of gravity of so we're trying to figure out the new acceleration due to gravity all right well let's see what we can work with this here um, acceleration, centripetal acceleration, is from v squared over r. Huh. All right. Now, if you think about it, if you're moving in a circle around a planet, the centripetal acceleration is caused by the acceleration due to gravity. So let's see if we can leverage this equation to get that done for us. Well, we have 78,000 meters per second. That's going to get squared over r. Now, ah, keep in mind, 200 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Not orbital radius, but above the Earth's surface. So that is going to be 200,000 meters plus whatever the radius of the Earth is. I'm going to go take a second to look that up for you, if I can find my mouse. Oh dear, where'd it go? Well, that's embarrassing. There it is. So for the excruciatingly long time it took me to find my mouse, I finally did. I found the radius of the Earth, and the radius of the Earth is 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters. All right, and then I'm going to add our 200,000 meters. I'll just put it in scientific notation so we're consistent there with those two things. And 2.0 E5 plus 6.37 E6 is going to be 6.57 times 10 to the 6 meters. So, again, the distinction here is the difference between the radius of the planet and the orbital radius. The radius of the planet is just gets you to here. This tells us how high above the Earth's surface we are, 200 kilometers. So we have to add those two things together, and we put that number down here at the bottom. And if we put that number at the bottom, don't uh, and, we, and we drop this in here, so we've got 7,800 squared divided by 6.57 E6. We're getting, this is good news, 9.26. Why is that good news? Because on the surface of the Earth, we know our gravitational acceleration is 9.8. We get a slightly lower number. Why? Because we're getting further away from the planet, where you have a certain height above the planet. So I feel good about that answer. All right, let's look at another moon example here. A moon is in circular orbit around a planet. The planet exerts a gravitational force of this on the moon. The centripetal acceleration of the moon is most nearly. All right, so what can we do here? Well, we have Fg equals uh, our normal equation, big G mm over r squared. Sorry about that sloppiness there. You guys know the gravitational equation by this point in the lesson. Um, what we can do here to find this centripetal acceleration is we can think of this idea that fg is equal to fc, which means it's equal to mac, right? So um, we can manipulate a few things here. Uh, if I know this guy right here, it does say the gravitational force on the moon, so two times, uh, sorry, two times 10 to the 21st newtons equals, oh, this is super easy, times 10 to the 20th kilograms times AC. Just divide both sides by that and get your answer. That's not too bad at all. Here comes the calculator magic. Bam, FC equals MAC. We know the force of gravity exerted on the moon, so we plug it in for FC. We know the mass of the moon, so we plug it in for mass, and we get the acceleration. Centripetal acceleration is 20 meters per second squared on that moon. There is one more on our sheet, but I don't know we'll have time to get to it here. But if I wave my magic wand and you consider the FG comparisons that we've been doing today, take a look at this work and I think you can figure it out for yourself. This is Mr. Simpkins with Gravity in the Simpkins Physics
corner.